So with my technical background, I started off doing security assessments, so finding vulnerabilities in applications, uh, reverse engineering applications, so we could then find vulnerabilities and then exploit them. But then since then, I've really focused on forensics and incident response. And on the forensic side, I spent several years solely focused on the insider threat. I know we just had a question on that. There was other topics. Um, I'll definitely be talking about that. And when we look at insider threat, this is where someone is harming their company for personal profit. So they're stealing the customer list, they're stealing proprietary information, they're then selling it to competitors, they're starting their own business on the side with that data, or they're otherwise just profiting and making money, uh, basically ripping, ripping their company off. And the vast majority of these investigations we did would go into some type of legal proceeding, whether it was civil court, criminal court. So when we did our investigations, there was very specific ways that we had to acquire the data, ways to analyze the data, and then document what we did. And then on the incident response side, uh, for the last several years, I've been helping companies deal with intruders, whether they've already been breached, whether they're trying to be more proactive and find ways that attackers could get in, and working with companies to essentially secure their network as much as possible. And the reason that I'm starting this talk by presenting my background this way is because I've been burned by startups a lot. And I was talking to Alyssa, most of my presentations involve IDA Pro and reversing malware and very technical things. So I was telling her, like, what, what can I really bring to this audience? And she told me there's a lot of founders, a lot of people developing software. So I kind of wanted to bring that perspective to it. And the way we've been burned by these types of companies is that the way the applications are developed, the way the web services are made, the back ends are made, they don't really support uh, effective forensics. They don't support effective investigations. So it's really hindered our efforts when we want to go back and get historical data, when we want something that's going to stand up in court and say this is exactly what happened in the environment. It's very difficult to do that, especially with startups, unfortunately. And it's not only bad on me, it not only makes my job difficult, it gets startups a bad reputation and it gets them moved out of big companies. Because with big companies, they don't want to lose in court. They don't want to be laughed out of a courtroom. They don't want a federal judge saying, what are you doing? You're incompetent. And they don't have those problems with some of the more established companies. So from a startup perspective, you're not only losing contracts if you're not going to have some of the features I'm gonna talk about, but you're also really gonna hurt your brand. Because if you're here, you probably know it's a very small community. There's security conferences all the time. Uh, people talk all the time. So once you burn one company, it's gonna quickly go around. People have peers at the same level as them. CISOs talk to CISOs, IT directors talk to IT directors. You're gonna get a bad reputation very quickly. And I probably don't have to tell the people in this room that as a startup, your brand is everything. And so my goal with this presentation is to show companies in general, but particularly startups, how you can design your applications to really support enterprises when they get breached, when they have to do forensics investigations, or when they're bringing your, the results of what you're doing into court. And if what I'm talking about is completely new to you, um, try not to freak out, but definitely play, pay close attention. Because as breaches have become weekly occurrences, as they're, you're hearing about them all the time, security's in the boardroom now. It's not down at the geek level, it's not down at people who code. Everyone has some notion of why security is important. And because of that, you're seeing a, a push from the CISOs, from the CTOs, from a, even at the CEO level, to really scrutinize companies. If, if a company is going to give you their sensitive data, they're gonna let you process their sensitive data, especially if you're gonna do it in the cloud, which the vast majority of startups are doing, they're really gonna look at you, how you handle that data, what your policies are, how you secure it, and then when they need to go access that data for their own purposes, how are they gonna be able to get it? But this talk isn't just focused 100% on startups, it's very relevant, but it's also to the people inside the companies evaluating security products. Because many of the products that we see that have burned us in investigations, they really should have never been in production in the first place. The people that were evaluating them uh, really didn't have a good idea as far as what forensics use they were gonna need out of that product later. And this is unfortunate, because what normally happens is a company gets compromised, uh, whether it's an insider taking data, whether it's a remote compromise from somewhere on the internet, they then start an investigation and they don't get very far. They go to the application, they contact you and say, okay, what data can you give us about this breach? And you say, what do you mean? We don't support that. Like, well, this is our data, what do you want from it? You have this web interface to your data, you have maybe this admin interface to your data, and that's as good as it gets. 
But that doesn't really cut it when you're trying to figure out why your data was leaked or what data was leaked. Or you want to go to court and say, we want to prosecute this person for what they did or we want to sue this person for what they did. And again, this is, this is something that the business is going to get burned once and then they're never going to do business with you again. And I think I have a, maybe a bad reputation with some startup people in different places because I've had to be the bad guy on the call and say, look, we need this data, like, why can't you give it to us? Well, okay, if you can't give us to us, you get to go talk to the internal counsel. They're not always nice people, and you get to tell them why our investigation is not going to work. And so my goal, again, with this talk is to prevent you from being in such a situation. Also, you're going to have to excuse me for one second because it doesn't show here, but my PowerPoint crashed on here. So, yay, Microsoft. Uh, <laughs> 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 All right. All right, we have movement. Let me, uh, uh, y'all can, okay, let me fix it up here again. All right, yeah, okay. So I wanna start the real deep discussion by looking at three areas where I've seen these applications fail. And again, when I say fail, I'm coming from a forensics perspective. All I care about is you've been breached, you've had an insider who's taking data, I need to help you figure out what happened, we need to be able to get reproducible, re reproducible evidence out of that environment. And the worst place I see that is with those insider threats, which I know there was a question from, from this side of the room about it. And if you look at the studies that come out, multiple studies across industries, across uh, analysts and vendors, insider threat is the biggest threat that companies face. And it's actually really hard to get right. You have employees, you have contractors, they need to be able to access your sensitive data in order to do their job, but you need to be able to kind of police that access. You need to restrict them from data they're not supposed to see. And you need to be able to have proper logging and authentication to that data so they can't, so at least if they do take the data, you can go back and try to figure out what they did. And unfortunately, what we see is the main way that insiders abuse their access to data is through third party applications. So, whether it's something internal, whether it's something hosted in the cloud, again, they have access to that data and they're just taking it out and moving it outside of the company's control. So, because of this, it's really important that your applications produce very detailed logs. Um, we've done investigations where very complex web applications, very complex web services, we say we need logs to support our investigation. And then they come back and say, okay, well, here's the Apache access log. It says post index.php and, and that's it. And you have a timestamp, you have no idea what user did that, no idea what the parameters were set, can't do a whole lot with that investigation. So instead, when you're designing your application, when you're deciding what's going to be logged, you need to think about it more from a forensics perspective. From my point of view, the ideal situation are the applications that log everything. Whatever parameters you send to a page get logged, the date, the date and the time the, that request was sent gets logged, and then certainly the username if there's some type of authentication. Because what that provides is an audit log or an audit trail. I can go to you and say, hey, from this date to this date, we believe this certain user within your system uh, was abusing their access. And then you say, okay, give us two hours, whatever your SLA is, and we get a log back. And it shows us everything that user did in that time frame. We can then look at it and say, oh yeah, this person was definitely accessing data they shouldn't have, they shouldn't have been, or they were abusing their access. The next thing we can do is go to a judge, go to a lawyer and say, look, we know this person did this, let's get these legal proceedings moving. But there's a big gap, huge gap, if you have given me the Apache access logs or the Apache error logs, uh, which you haven't seen them, that they're kind of useless or in most cases from an IR perspective, uh, versus that deep audit trail that uh, is going to allow us to figure out what the person did. The other thing this helps with, and uh, Dan touched on this as well, is being proactive in your defense. Being able to look at your data, see what changes, what does your data tell you about your environment? So what companies can do, and, and I know we've helped many companies that do this, we hear about it at conferences as well, companies go look through those logs proactively. So they go look through and say what data is being accessed, who's, who's accessing it, and is this something normal? Is this something that's supposed to be there? And in those cases, you can find insiders before they really hurt your company. You can find remote attackers very soon after they're on your network, and it's not six months or a year later, your data ends up on Pastebin, your data ends up on like mega upload, um, or you just, you can tell that your data has been compromised based on how your business is going. So through that proactive defense, you really get ahead of the attackers and you get ahead of those malicious insiders. But if your applications are a black hole and they don't tell you anything that's going on inside of them, um, it makes it pretty difficult. 
And you have to also think about this from the company's perspective, your client's perspective. They're giving you thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars to host their data, work with their data, and they say, okay, well, what's going on with my data in your environment? And they go, well, why do you wanna know that? Or what do you expect us to give you about that? It doesn't really work out that well in the real world. And again, this is something that are gonna get companies to find another provider. They're gonna stop working with you. And I can say uh, pretty definitively that this lack of logging is really the main reason I've seen companies go with uh, a different provider. And unfortunately, what I see them do is leave the startup world. I always see this term tossed around the dinosaur companies. They've been around 20 years. Um, they're the ones that get the big contracts. And there's some innovative startup. There's a startup that competes in that space. But the big enterprise goes with the older company. And if you look from a technology perspective, the older company is really boring. I mean, 20 year old technology, the user interfaces are repulsive, they're gray and blue, not dynamic. And as Dan said, they're gonna force you to Internet Explorer 6 or 7. You try to use Firefox or Chrome, they're like, what are those things? Who in an enterprise uses those? Uh, mobile applications like aren't even around yet. And you say, I have this awesome startup, we provide you, you know, your technology bullet list is exactly what you wanted. Why would you pick this company? And unfortunately, it's someone like me or my peers in the background that says, hey, as cool as that app is, what happens if you get compromised? Or what happens if you need a security assessment done? And the problem, that's one of the big problems we see out of the startup world, is focus not on the security needs and certainly not on the forensics needs. And so those old companies are gonna stay in business and keep getting contracts as long as that stays a problem. The other big thing, and I know we have some lawyers in the room, so uh, don't throw anything at me if I get some of this mixed up or if I get the wrong definition. Uh, but the other big place where startups fall is during discovery and other legal processes. We've had cases go very high through federal courts. We've had cases involving millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, things get, there's very particular processes you have to go through in order for that data to stand. And unfortunately, one of the biggest things is discovery. If you're a web application provider, if you're hosting all the company's financial data, HR data, whatever it is your application does, if that falls under a discovery request, which um, if you're not, out, if you haven't had to deal with this before, discovery is where a third party, normally a judge, sometimes it's a lawyer on the other side, says, in order for this case to go through, um, we've been granted discovery. This is a list of keywords, this is a set of data, and we need everything that you have related to it. So you'll get keywords of email addresses, people involved in projects, names of competing companies. Whatever it is that's relevant to that legal proceeding, you have to go through all of your data, electronic data, stored data, uh, <coughs> non-electronic data as well, and turn over everything that's relevant. So this is where the startups start to fall. Because you say, hey, you hold my emails, or you hold messages that we send internally, or you hold my HR data. I need every record that you have for my company about this. And there's kind of, well, there's three ways it can go. The best way is you have an interface that's provided to the company to do it. They do their search terms, you kick them out the data in a reasonable format, and then they can take that to court. The other thing is you can have an agreement that says you send us search terms, you know, maybe depending on what type of company you have, they'll have to send the, uh, the actual discovery request over as well. And then you say within 24 hours, within 12 hours, within a week, whatever you agree to, we're gonna send you the responsive data. The worst thing is, and, and unfortunately we see this a lot too, is, well, we don't support that. Our, inter our application interface, our web interface, our API gives you this data, and if what you want doesn't fit inside of that API, what it's going to give you, well, you're kind of out of luck. And I'm telling you, uh, as soon as you say that, as soon as you say that, we can't help your discovery request, or we're going to make you lose your billion dollar case in court, um, there's gonna be a three part reaction. And I've seen this over and over again. The first thing is the forensics investigator or, some, or someone else with uh, coding skills, they're gonna start scraping your application. They're gonna just basically call, e call every page, call all the APIs, get as much data as possible, and then they're gonna have to do custom discovery. And I don't know if the other lawyers in the room use that term exactly that way, but once companies start making up uh, creative ways to do discovery, the judges usually start to go crazy. And the other side, the lawyers on the other side say, what are you trying to pull? Get out of here, you know, like you're incompetent. So the first thing, again, is someone like me or someone else with the coding skills has to pull all the data out. The second thing is the people involved in IT purchasing decisions at the company, they're gonna start shopping for alternatives. They're gonna call up their vendors, they're gonna call up their peers and say, hey, this company just burned us in federal court you know, what, do, what are you using? Do they support this? You know, we don't want to get burned again. And the third thing that's going to happen is the internal counsel is going to pull out your service contract 
They're going to go through with the fine tooth, fine tooth, I can't see that word, fine tooth comb, and they're going to work as hard as they can to figure out how to break your contract. And they're going to do it without paying you any early termination fees or anything else. And again, this is this is not where you want to be. It may sound harsh. It may sound like why would they be so difficult, but you have to think about the effect on the business. You're not just annoying tech geeks down in the data center at this point. You're making the internal counsel look bad. You're making the CFO look bad. You're making the entire company look bad on a very public stage. So if you want to avoid this, um, build these things, these features into your product and, and make sure they work and, and make them known. Um, because I'm telling you, uh, as soon as you make a company sweat during legal processes, they're not going to work with um, I've seen it as quick as 72 hours later, the lawyers say, we, you have this in your clause. If you don't meet these needs, we're out. We're out. If you have a problem, bring us to court. And that's it. And they've already moved on to another provider. And then the last reasonable method, and uh, this is both a, a personal grievance and also one from the forensics world, is being able to provide migration support and backup support. I don't care how many different data centers in Amazon you send data to, how many different places in the country. At some point, I'm going to want to back up of my data. It doesn't mean anything bad about your service, doesn't mean I don't trust you, but it's nice to have it in my own place. So if I say I want to back up, whether that's online, whether I pay you to buy external drives or whatever and you ship them to me, have some reasonable process to do that. The other thing is migration. And this is a place where every company, regardless of how much litigation they're involved with, anything else, migration has burned too many companies. Everyone knows about it now. People get burned at one company, they move to another. Most people are gonna sign a contract with you. It's gonna have a limited set of years, two, three years, maybe five years at the most. As that contract is wrapping up, they're gonna look for alternatives. And if they decide that they wanna go with an alternative, they're gonna want some way to get their data out of your service so that they can bring it to another one. And if your way of migration is, well, we don't support migration, or here's a non-searchable PDF file or some other ridiculous way of doing it, they're probably never gonna sign with you in the first place because it kind of shows a lack of what would that be? Like confidence in your product to say, we're not going to support migration because we don't want you to ever leave us. Versus, yeah, if you want to migrate, it's in our contract. We have an SLA. 72 hours later, we'll have your data on a truck from FedEx. It's in this very easy format. Uh, your developers can then import it wherever you decide to go. It shows that you really designed your architecture well. It shows you can find the people's data well. It also gets into something I'm going to talk to you next, which is um, reducing data risk. And one of the biggest things is, you will be out of, business, out of business very quickly if someone used to be a customer of yours and a year or two later, you have to call them up and say, oh, we had a breach in your data was taken. And you're like, wait, we haven't even been with you, you know, since the breach happened, what's going on? Uh, and that's something else that companies are gonna ask for as well. But as I kind of hinted, providing that useful access to data, supporting the legal processes, supporting the incident response and the forensics, and supporting the migration is really only one part of this. Uh, Dan touched on some of these a bit. This is where we start to overlap. Um, but these are things that even companies that do the most minimal due diligence, they're going to ask these questions and they're going to expect this support. And the first one is going to be, what do you do in the back end? Uh, Dan had talked about no service accounts, monitoring who logs in, monitoring who accesses data. That's extremely important. And that's something if you don't do, you're never going to make it past what I call the security interview. You're going to have to sit down in a room with security architects, maybe the CTO, maybe the CISO, and they're going to want very definitive answers to this. And when we look at logging the back end data, it's different than the application. Because if I'm an authenticated user, I go through your web application, I go through your mobile app, whatever interface you give me, that's different than if you have a rogue insider or if you have an attacker that's inside of your environment. Now they're connecting directly to the database. Maybe they have local access to your web server, uh, your servers that process the data. That's a whole different type of logging and analysis that you have to do when forensics turns that way. So even if you can tell me everything people did through the application, it doesn't tell me what's going on in your environment. So you need, but you do need to handle this. You need logs from the operating system, from your web server, from your database server, and those need to be just as detailed and useful as the application logs. Because when we do forensics, um, it kind of burns us two ways. One is if the data is not there, we can't investigate it. We can't tell you what happened. And then the other thing is when you're taking something to court, any type of legal setting, very specific uh, guidelines on how data gets there. You can't make up data, you have to be able to prove uh, oftentimes with multiple different pieces of evidence from a machine what happened there. And if you're not logging data, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot. 
the other thing is uh, segmenting customer data and um, customer data, and then your sensitive company data. Uh, this is something where Dan's talk and mine overlaps completely because with customer they're going to want to make sure their data is protected as well as possible. Obviously, we know it's impossible to 100% secure a network, but they're going to want to see policy that defines what you're doing, written policies that define what you're doing, and also someone with a technical background to explain what they're doing. They might not walk into your data center, they might not log into your consoles, but they're going to want some assurances of what you're doing. The other thing, as I said, is it's often called a zero risk policy. If I call you up today and I migrate my data out, there needs to be some time window, a month, two months, three months, whatever you can get the company to agree to, that after that you have no more of my data, not in your backups, not in a random location somewhere else, certainly not on your live systems. But to do that, you really need to pre-plan for that support. Because if you didn't pre-plan for this and I say, hey, where's all the data for customer one, two, three, well, what do you do at that point? You have to say, well, how do we replicate data? How do we backup data? Do we still have offsite backup to you know in a mountain somewhere? All of that is going to be a problem. And so you need to be able to track exactly where your customer data is so you can get rid of it. And this is one thing that the lawyers will, will definitely kill you on. If you can't convince the internal counsel or whoever is representing them uh, in the contract negotiations for this, they're not going to do it. Because why would they spend money with you, not be happy with your service, move on to someone else, and then five years later their customer data is online because it was taken. Um, and I can guarantee you that if this happens, if you have sensitive enough data, uh, the lawsuits against you will, will put you out of business. I don't care how much cyber insurance you have or anything else. Uh, if you lose people's data three, five years later, any type of personal information, uh, no court's gonna have mercy on you. And the other thing here, and it's the last bullet point, uh, is having written policies for, for the data retention. By having written policies, you save yourself both ways, the technical side and the legal side. You can't go into a courtroom with a judge and say, well, this is how we did it. And he says, well, what governed that policy? And you say, oh, well, I just you know, told people what to do. I memorized it. And then from the technical side, that's something you can give the people you work with. Um, not really too political, but I've been following the, uh, the technical side of the stuff with Clinton, uh, Hillary Clinton's emails. And the technical side's fascinating. They had the backup company. And they're like, we deleted the backups. And, and the guy was like, well, what policies did that? And the dude's like, oh, we're running out of space, so we deleted things. Like, that's mind blowing to me. Um, and again, I'm not talking the politics side. All, all I find interesting is the technical side, because places I've been, like, you would be fired that second if that happened. And so, and, but having those policies in place saves the company, because you can say, this technical person went rogue. Our policies here define what's supposed to happen in those situations. And now you're firing one person, maybe as manager, depending how it goes, uh, but your entire company is not folding. And the last two slides, maybe are scary if you're in production, close to production, and you're like, man, I don't support any of this. Uh, you might be a little nervous at this point. Um, I would say it's not hopeless. Uh, I will talk about some cases where it was hopeless in the past. Um, but you should also see it as a positive. Because if you meet even half of the stuff I just talked about, if you have that in your product, that's an amazing advertising point, especially when you're going into big enterprises. Because you can tell them, look, if you have to go into discovery, if you're going into court, our application supports that. Or if you need to migrate, our application supports that. Or hey, if you're compromised, we can tell you every single action that occurred through our application. And the people in business that only thinking dollars and numbers, that might interest them. But I can tell you if lawyers hear that, if the CTO hears that, if the CISO hears that, you're going to go to the top of the list when they're saying, who should we bring in to provide this service? So if you don't have these, um, freak out a little bit because you probably should have them. But also look at it as a good thing. That the fact that you can advertise this to people, you can bring it up in meetings, is only going to make you look better. And then one of the last things I'll talk about, because uh, I think I might be running out of time, is hiring security help. Uh, I have the slides or the screenshots up here. It's amazing that all these major companies that get breached, all their sensitive information is taken, and the next thing they do is hire a CISO. They're like, well, maybe we should have cared about security in, in the first place. And these slides also show you that big companies certainly aren't immune to it. But fortunately for these companies, and I think uh, Dan basically said the same thing, Home Depot is not going out of business, Target's not going out of business because people's credit cards are taken. You get a new credit card in the mail, life moves on. It's not too much of a hassle. But if it's a medical company and maybe they lose everyone's records, it might be different. But kind of stores like this are not going anywhere just because they, they get breached and they lose credit cards. On the other hand, um, a breach can definitely kill your startup. If you have 100 customers, you're still basically going through beta, you have to email or send letters to all those 100 people and say, all the data you entrusted with is gone, 
they don't have a whole lot of reason to stay with you. They're probably going to go somewhere else. The other thing this slide kind of shows, though, or that I want to talk about, is having a CISO is, is probably overkill for most startups. If you have 10 employees and one's a CISO, that's probably a weird way to kind of break down your company. Instead, what you need is someone who's going to really help you from a more hands-on perspective. Uh, normally, this would be called like a security architect or just an IT security person. Uh, but the idea is they need to be there for all of the design decisions. They need to be looking for security flaws. They need to be making sure that everything that I talked about on the last couple slides is accounted for. And that's their entire job. They also need actual power to do that, not just saying, hey, this is horrible, everyone else overrules them, and then the design goes on as it was anyway. But if you can get someone in there to kind of guide those decisions, it'll really save you from pain in the future. But even at a startup, maybe a full-time security person, like a security architect, you might not be able to afford it, or it might not fit into your current business plan. So in that case, if you can't, you're, as I say, you're probably not gonna bring a CISO on, you can't afford a, another like hands-on full-time person, at least have a security advisor. Find someone who's been in the field, understands what businesses are actually expecting from your companies and your applications, and have them for the design decisions. They don't have to look at every line of code, they don't have to do product, security reviews of your products, you know, testing the live application, but they can look at the design architecture. They can say, that's a terrible idea, or that authentication scheme is never going to work, or where's the login going to be? If this application gets compromised, what will the client know about it? And one of the first benefits you'll get from this, and you'll notice it's the only time I really use color in my slides, is finding the weaknesses early. And this is one of the hardest things we've had to do for companies. Um, they're in production, they have, they're in production, they have customers, uh, they're already making money on this application, and you have to tell them, your security is so broken, your design is so broken that you need to shut this down. I tell one story, uh, not because it's funny, but because it's true, is the first time I ever had to lead a client call, I was in college working for a security consulting company, and we broke this application so bad that we knew it basically had to go back to the first line of code and be completely rewritten. So I get picked as, I don't know, it was like 19, 20 at the time, and they said, you're gonna lead the client call, you led most of this assessment, uh, we think it would be a good experience. So I call up the, the, the company that hired us to do the assessment. Uh, there was the developer on the phone, it was, or the lead developer on the phone, it was her boss and her boss's boss. And they say, hey, we designed this really security. Did you happen to you know, find anything bad? And I had to explain it. By the time I was done explaining just how bad it was, uh, the developer had broke down in tears. It was the most awkward first call ever. Um, it basically ended with her boss saying, um, I don't remember her name, but say it was Elizabeth or something, like, hey, you know, Elizabeth is uh, kind of unconsolable right now. We'll get back to you with the result. I, mean, I don't know, you kind of have a bad day after that, right? But, but the point was, this isn't me bragging, I'm not saying I'm the only one to, did the, to do this. Um, I'm not the only person that's done this. Talk to anyone that's been a security consultant. Talk to anyone who has like real security consulting experience. Everyone's broken an application to that point. And in the worst case, I had one and, and the client told us after, uh, we had broken their authentication scheme so much and the authentication scheme was kind of the whole point of the app. Um, we had broken it so badly that the product never saw the light of day. They called up the company I was working for. They said, we want a security assessment. We know we're secure. We basically just want to be able to mark a checkbox that said we had an assessment. Um, I keep going back to Dan's talk, but he mentioned the same thing, getting those security assessments done because it looks really good to clients. So we did the big assessment of this application. It was for a huge company, uh, Fortune 500. Um, and it was broke so bad that they just scrapped the whole project. They fired a team that was working on it and it never saw the light of day. So at that point, the CTO, whoever was in charge of the tech at that point, has to go to the finance people and say, we burned two years, millions of dollars, and we're not gonna get any money out of it. And how all of this can be fixed, my whole point in talking about this, is finding it early. If you're in the design decision, the design phase, you have what your architecture is gonna look like on paper, you bring it to a security expert, you bring it to someone who's done forensics, and you say, is this okay, or what's wrong with this? And then they can immediately say, that's the worst thing I've ever seen, you need to learn security 101, don't do that. And it's frustrating, it might be embarrassing in the beginning, but especially as a startup, it can save you from going out of business. 
Because if you get funding from a VC company, if you have your own money from different sources, you burn all of it develop, developing your product, and then it's too secure to go into production, what do you do at that point? Uh, you can't start from scratch, you don't have the money to do it, you have to tell the people that you, know, you hired and that you brought on uh, that the company is not going to go anywhere. Uh, again, which is a conversation uh, that you want to, uh, that you probably want to avoid. The other thing, and the, uh, the second point, is when you're bringing in a security expert, don't just bring in the run-of-the-mill security person. Um, this whole slide is not a big pitch to like hire me to be your advisor. If you have, especially if you're focusing on one industry, healthcare, finance, government, whatever it is, find someone with deep experience. Find someone who's been a CISO of a major bank. Find someone who is a senior security architect at a major bank or a major set of hospitals or doctor's clinics spread around the country. Those people are gonna understand everything I'm talking about. And you kinda heard in the last talk from Dan's perspective of being a CISO. Find someone who had to vet, vet the security companies. Find someone who got burned by the problems I'm talking about. You have them as an advisor and they're gonna be very critical before they let you move on design phase. The other thing, and kind of leads into the third bullet point is once you get past one, two, three employees, even if you're all star developers, you're developing technology, you, always are, you are always gonna rely on a third party as well. So before you decide where you're gonna put your company data, you want someone to advise you on that. Um, again, I didn't edit this slide when Dan was talking, but he used the exact phrase, security snake oil. If you go to big vendor conferences, big security conferences, people are gonna tell you, plug this box into your network or put this application on all your endpoints and you never have to worry about security again. If you're sitting here in this room, you probably know that's not true, um, but it sounds very convincing to people, especially people uh, that might be above you, people at the board level. They say, hey, I dropped $5 million on this, we put on all the endpoints, and this you know, sales guy says we don't have to care anymore, we're secure. At that point, you have to then go argue with the salesperson. So if you have an advisor um, with real influence in the company, they can do those product evaluations for you. They can talk to peers who maybe use those products in the past, still use those products, um, and save you from a lot of pain. And then the other, or the last thing, or one of the last things an advisor gives you is actual credibility to your security program. Um, I work for a, a startup, but it's, it's very different than, than the startups in here, and we do security stuff. So, so we don't really have a security credibility problem. But if you're a developer and you're making, um, again, applications to serve different companies, non-security related, someone's gonna know, the people that you're selling to are gonna wanna know, how do I know your security means anything? Was it your off-the-shelf developers that maybe don't have the security background? Or was there someone known in the community, the security community, the forensic community, someone who's been in those high-level roles in companies that says, I approve of this design? Is that person willing to go to meetings or hop on calls and say, I'm so-and-so, I was a CISO here, I ran IT for this Fortune 100 company, um, I can tell you that the way they did security uh, meets my level of confidence and, and I'll put my name behind it. The other thing is if you get advisors at that level, they're probably peers and probably already know all the CISOs and the people high up in IT that you're gonna sell to. So they can call up their friends, say, hey, I know you're looking for a secure version of this service. I just joined as an advisor with this company. Uh, how about you let them do the demo? Um, so there's really no negative downsides. There's not a slide that says the fallbacks of a security advisor. It's something you want, and it's something that you should encourage inside of your company. Um, and as I mentioned several times, it can save you from going out of business prematurely because they'll save you from those issues that uh, will lose all of your customers and, and really hurt your brand name. And then the last thing I'll talk about is building a security culture. Um, this is something that is going to help you when you eventually get targeted, when you have that insider that's hurting, that wants to hurt your business, when you have remote attackers that decide to target you, but it also just kind of permeates throughout the, throughout the company, and it also shows when you're talking to clients. So the biggest thing is encrypting every email that's sent. If you ever send an email that's not PGP or encrypted with something else, you should feel dirty. You should want to immediately go take a shower, like think of the thousands of people that just intercepted that email and will never be secure again. The other thing is, if you walk, if let's say I fish someone in your environment and I get access to their, uh, or sorry, let's say I fish someone in your environment, I get access to your email server, or let's say like most startups, you don't host your own email. You have email out in the cloud somewhere. If I compromise that account and all I have to do is just read people's mailboxes and now I have every email you've ever sent internal to clients and so on, you're basically making it too easy. Versus if everyone's using, I know some people don't like PGP, but I'm gonna keep that as my example. If everyone's using PGP, all the emails that are on your server are encrypted. There's a lot of metadata there, the subject, the time it was sent, who the recipients were, but the actual contents and the attachments are encrypted. 
And the only way this can be open is by having the person's PGP key that sent the email. So at that point, instead of compromising your email server, I have to go compromise every single user in their environment, take all of their keys, and then I can finally open it. And I can tell you, uh, again, from firsthand experience, that companies that enforce this have been safe. They would have been on the front page of the New York Times, every email leaked, because they were fully compromised on the server side, but the end users weren't. And all of the users had PGP keys, their emails were encrypted uh, with that key, so the attackers never got access to that data. And it was the only thing that saved them from you know, being on the previous slide where people had to hire CISOs. The other thing is, um, and this applies to your personal life as well, is using secure messaging and voice applications. I know Silent Circle is well represented here, but the idea is this is something else that should make you feel very, very dirty as a person. You send a text message, you call someone on like the normal ways of doing it, thousands of people literally have every byte and copy of that conversation. And it's one thing if you're calling your husband, wife, friend, but it's another thing when you're discussing sensitive things about the business. There's so many applications out there. Um, you can obviously buy black phones as well, to handle this for you. So please stop sending text messages and please stop making normal voice calls. Third point, hardening employee systems. Um, if you have a Mac in here and you don't have File Vault turned on, you should somewhat be embarrassed right now. Like you should be blushing right now, like this is horrible. It takes three seconds to turn File Vault on and an hour or two later, your hard drive's encrypted. And if you look at some of the breaches that happen that have gone public, it's ridiculous. If someone works at a hospital, they leave their laptop in their trunk Someone steals the laptop and now all this data is public. Literally all the IT person had to do was check one box that said enable file vault. If you're on Windows, you check the one box that says enable BitLocker. It really doesn't get a whole lot easier than that. And then the other thing is software. Um, and this bleeds into the next point as well. If you do have take a stock browser, I don't care if it's Chrome, Firefox, Safari, whatever, IE does not count, whatever your normal choice is, by default, browsers are not secure. They're meant to make every web page work as best as possible and let ad networks work as best as possible. But if you throw on a few plugins, throw on a few extensions, um, one of my favorite ones, SSL Everywhere, the developers actually in the room, that's going to help you from those stock attacks. It's going to, and it's going to greatly enhance your security posture. The other thing is compartmentalizing data. If you're a startup with a couple million dollars in funding, you can afford one or two more laptops. It, it makes my eyes bleed when I see people doing Facebook on the same machine where their corporate email is and then they log into like the VPN and they're checking out code related to their products. They have access to customer data. That's inexcusable. Laptops are like $1,000 at, at the most. You can go to Best Buy and get one for like $200 and run Thunderbird on it. Your email should not be on the same laptop that you're web browsing. It should not be on the same laptop that you're logging into a corporate VPN. It takes a little bit of effort, but MacBook Airs are, I think, three ounces. You could easily carry around a few of them. Keep that data separate. <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe it's a little off, but the point is, uh, keep the data separate. Why, you know, if your browser is not secure, you visit one bad web page, that's going to compromise your machine, and now everything about your life is compromised. Versus you do your browsing on a machine you don't care about and that you re-image uh, often, or in my case, you do browsing in virtual machines, really doesn't matter. There's not a whole lot of data there. But if you're going to keep everything together, um, you're going to lose it. And this is how attackers get in, especially if you're a startup that doesn't have an office, uh, if people are working remote. Attacker gets in, they compromise someone in the middle of the night when they're doing random browsing. The next morning, they connect to the VPN to start working, and then the attacker is piggyback off of that same access. Please don't let that happen. Uh, have a policy, force your employees and yourself to, to compartmentalize that data. And then the last thing is using two-factor everywhere. Um, if you're not using two-factor, not sure what you're doing at this point, but don't let it be where one password gets stolen, you're gonna have employees that reuse passwords everywhere, force them to use two-factor authentication. And demand two-factor authentication when you buy products. If it secures your company's data, make sure that's two-factor. And then uh, you can probably figure it out if you're making an application and you're trying to say it's security conscious or whatever, and you don't support two-factor authentication, you're going to get really weird looks, and you probably won't get uh, too many contracts. And then the last part of that is encouraging people to actually learn about security, even if they're not security role, even if they're just kind of a normal developer, web developer, there's still a lot you can learn about security. And you don't have to spend a lot of money on this. All of the big conferences, uh, I spent several hours last weekend watching videos from DerbyCon. They were all on YouTube. They didn't go to the conference, they didn't pay anything. Many, many conferences, DEF CON, Black Hat, even big ones, all of their talks go on YouTube. 
So find some way to encourage developers and people in your company to actually learn a little bit about security. Maybe give them time during the day, uh, give them breaks at the end of the day and say, you know, watch some videos on security and then maybe you can do an internal presentation. Watch five videos, do a 10 minute pre presentation next week at lunch for everyone. Let's get security to really be on the minds of everyone in the company. And then also uh, conference participation. Obviously if you're here, you probably uh, value that. But it's, again, it's not something you don't have to spend thousands of dollars at RSA. Uh, there's a B-Size New York that's happening in January. There's B-Size and other conferences all around the Northeast. Um, it's a good way to not only learn about security, but meet people in the industry. So when you look for advisors, people you want to ask questions for help, you reward secure design, secure coding. Uh, it just motivates people that much more. So in conclusion, uh, startups, please stop making my life difficult, burning my clients during investigations. Uh, security architects actually put some thought into forensics and security before you put things in production. Uh, and then if you're at a startup, no matter really what company you're at, try to make a security culture there. Be secure by default and actually encourage people to take an active role uh, in security and learning about it. So that's the end of my slides. Are there any comments or questions or anything?